Hi, I'm Janine. This is KUCI 88.9 FM in Irvine. And today's show, I'm in conversation with Donna Butts, Executive Director of Generations United. Welcome to the show. Thanks, Janine. It's great to be with you. As I mentioned, I'm right in the midst of a fellowship with Columbia School of Journalism. It's the Age Boom Academy, which I know you're familiar with. But I started thinking about how we're in this pandemic and a lot of our readings, they, they definitely touch on the fact it's not just older adults that are feeling isolated and lonely, but college students, which I knew, but I didn't know to, to, to the degree. No, oh, you're very right. People usually focus on one age group or the other and don't realize that we have more in common. And unfortunately, one of the things that older adults and younger people have in common is that heightened sense of social isolation, uh, of being alone for different reasons, but that's one reason why we think it's really important to advocate for intergenerational connections, because that is one thing they have in common and that could be addressed if we're connecting generations. Why do you think, do you think this was going on before the pandemic, that there was this amount of loneliness and isolation? I think it was going on before the pandemic, but I think the pandemic has really heightened it. And in particular for people who are going through transitions, whether it was a younger adult who was graduating from college and looking forward to, to going into the next phase of their lives and all of a sudden that slowed down or went on hold right. or older adults who may have been retiring and thinking about what this next phase in their lives were gonna be like. And all of a sudden it was very, very different. So I think the pandemic did heighten it, but I think that really when you think about young people and older people, those are groups that are oftentimes marginalized and not seen to have the kind of value that they actually have. Yes. I mean, I definitely have been hearing a lot about how teens and young adults, college students are experiencing enormous amounts of depression, anxiety, loneliness uh, because of the pandemic. But I find, and I found very few articles, but I find that when you give somebody at any age a sense of purpose and meaning, and when you tie these two generations, it just lifts you up. You're so right, because the one thing that we that we definitely have in common is that need for purpose, that need to feel like we're 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 our lives are worth living, that we're doing something with them. Uh, I always remember back to the first intergenerational program I did when I was a teen director at a YWCA in Salem, Oregon. And one of the programs I inherited was a friendly visit program that took high school sociology students for one-to-one -one visits with isolated older adults who were still in their own homes. And they, they would see each other once a week for a semester. And when I first started, I thought, well, what, you know, how could this be so powerful? What, what, what can this possibly mean? But what I learned very quickly was that we were, we're talking about young people who skipped school except for the day that they were gonna see their older friend and older adults who didn't get out of bed or open their curtains except for the day that that young person was coming. And what, they, what joined them, what brought them together was it gave them a reason to get out of bed, a reason to show up and purpose. So it, I, I think it's just incredibly important. I think there's so much we can do as a society to change the mindset of you know, bridging these two generations. I, I have not shared with you, I'm also a writer. I've written some scripts and I started thinking when I got this fellowship, how, why is it that I'm always wanting to write um, stories of a struggling teenager and connecting them with an older adult who has so much wisdom that they, they completely overlooked. And I make them into kind of comedies or dramedies. Well, it's because I had this close relationship with my grandmother mm -hmm. and she was so funny and so different than everybody else and so wise. And I want to treasure that. And I want to keep that in my work. And I think more people underestimate what they can find in those connections. I think that's wonderful that you have that that personal connection and that 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 testimony because you know what it meant you know what it meant in your life to have somebody believe in you and that's the one that's of the wonderful aspects about connecting younger and older people is that oftentimes they have the time to connect with each other whereas people more in, in between may be running and busy and juggling everything and so to have people who are actually there and present for each other is really important but I think that life experience that an older adult has uh, can be incredibly meaningful to a young person who's just beginning to gather those kinds of experiences. Uh, I think back to some work we did uh, when we were trying to 
look at whether or not older adults would be uh, at good volunteers at runaway and homeless uh, youth programs or, or day drop-in programs. And as I was talking to people in the field, what I heard was that older adults were their best volunteers because they had the experience, the patience, uh, but also if a kid brushed them off or said something that would be offensive, they just, it, it just, they either called them on it or it just went over, went past them because they knew that wasn't really what that young person intended. It was one of their defense mechanisms. Sure. It's so different when you think about the relationship between uh, a grandchild and a grandparent versus a child and their parents. It's a totally different relationship. It is. I loved it when, you may remember when uh, President and Mrs. Obama moved into the White House and Mrs. Robinson, uh, Michelle's mother, moved in with them. Yes. And a part of what happened was that she moved in with them because she allowed them, enabled them to be able to be, do the kind of crazy hours and put themselves into the work that needed to be done because she was there and she made sure that the daughters got to school, that they had somebody there in the afternoon. And she also could spoil them when she wanted to. She could be tough, but she could she could spoil them, but she also kept them real. They had to do their homework. They, yeah, so what, they lived in the White House. She kept them real. Yes. And grandparents can play that kind of strong role in a young person's life. Definitely. So share with me some of the strategies, the intergenerational strategies that um, your organization does. Well, Generations United, we're really uh, very fortunate for over 35 years, we have been the national organization that really advocates for programs and policies that connect generations. So we don't run programs ourselves. What we do is we help to develop the criteria for best practices we award uh, something called the Programs of Distinction designation, which is given only to programs that meet the criteria of a high quality intergenerational program. So we set those standards. We shine a light on really innovative work that's underway in communities around the country. We provide the connection for people who are in the field because it's so easy to think you're the only one who ever thought about bringing older adults into your classroom or the only one who thought about having you know young people do um, uh, visit older adults and so we really work to build the field to support the field um, and encourage innovation and, and quality so that's a big part of what we do but then we also do work on Capitol Hill uh, and really advocate for policies that recognize and engage people at, at all ages. And a part of that work has to do with grandparents and other relatives raising children, also grand families. Um, we do a lot in the area of uh, grand families as well as multi-generational families. But I think the sweet spot is the intergenerational piece, which is people who, are, who aren't related, but are grand friends. Yes. Like that girl on TikTok who accidentally moved into a retirement home. I mean, that's been happening, right? It has been. That was a great story. But you think about some of the facilities around the country that have made a point of, say, Judson Living, for example, um, in uh, Ohio that has set aside rooms for college students in the senior facility. Um, so they have music students that live and engage with the older adults and play music and are their neighbors. You know, they have dinner and they talk about what shoes are, are popular now or whatever. Um, so there are facilities that, that do that intentionally. Um, and there, there are just a multitude of different kinds of intergenerational or multi-generational living facilities. But I think those are really great examples. Definitely. Has there been uh, research you've come across? And if the answer is no, it's fine. But that has um, highlighted some of the efforts in the pandemic for intergenerational strategies. Right at the beginning of the pandemic, we were fortunate to work with um, Dr. Ernest Gonzalez, who's at, at NYU. And he uh, created a he, he and his students did a lit review and created a piece called Making the Case for Intergenerational um, programs that really, I, I think, captured in one place all of the research that we have at this point about the impact on people at various stages of their life when they're engaged with other generations. And it's a, it's a, a small but growing body of research um, that really does show that uh, what young people learn, whether it's the soft skills, patience, um, acceptance, tolerance, the things that young people learn 
and then older adults who take better care of themselves. Again, that purpose, that, yeah. that mental health, that more positive outlook, that, that feeling like they've got um, a reason, but also a larger social network. So during the pandemic, what we did was we really worked to try to keep people connected. A lot of it was by Zoom. We tried to harvest the really good work and the innovations that were underway around the country. And we published a, a piece on um, how to stay connected while socially distancing. That really gives a lot of those examples that are working very well. I think everybody's anxious to get back together and to touch each other again. Uh, but I am so grateful that people found a way uh, to, to keep the fire lit during the time when we couldn't be together. I mean, thank goodness for technology, because imagine years ago, we didn't have anything like this. We would just be on the phone, but the technology, be able to connect face to face has been amazing. Yeah, the technology has really been amazing. Um, but what's also come out, of course, is some of the what people consider to be the digital divide and the oh, need to make sure that older adults um, would have the understanding to be able to use the technology, but really also the income disparity in terms of who has decent access to internet access and to the equipment. Um, right. We struggled, a lot of the grand families we work with struggled because all of a sudden they're homeschooling these kids and maybe all they have is a flip phone. And that's as, that's as advanced as they've got, they've, yeah. they have gotten. So there was a lot of needing to understand how to help older adults learn about technology. Um, and uh, and it, it was uh, many, many, many older adults total embraced it and are now total whizzes. Um, but it's, it's um, I think we all are probably getting a little again, a little bit Zoom burned out, zoomed out, <laughs> zoomed, out zoomed out and ready, ready to have some face-to-face uh, -face time. But I think we've been so fortunate. What I've loved about it, actually, our international conference, Generations United's international conference is, is in June. It's coming up this I June. I saw that. I was going to ask about that. Yeah, I'm, I'm really excited about it because it's virtual. It means that we have more people from other countries because they're not Need, incurring the expense of traveling. We have more students. Um, we have more people who wouldn't necessarily be able to afford to come to a conference that are going to be able to participate in it. So that is one of the aspects of, of, um, of, of, of technology that I, I am grateful for. Um, we're really excited about the conference. Uh, we're going to have over 400 people that will wow. participate in the over the course of the three days. Um, I have to say when I looked at the, the, the program, at the number of sessions, at the ways that people are gonna be sharing knowledge, I was in tears because I remember when I started in this field over 20 years ago, you had like a bazillion reading buddy programs or you know home, you know, which, which are great. Sure. But there was such variety that's gonna be at the conference in terms of the innovation, the use of arts, the, the, the connection with the environment, um, the, the vast array of programs. I think it's gonna be really a rich, rich program. Are there still uh, tickets or is it still open to the public to sign up? Yes, it is, it is. I think the registration, the, the conference starts on June 14th and I think the registration starts about, ends about two days before that. But I'd encourage people that the cost goes up the end of May. So I'd encourage people to register uh, soon. And they can find the conference website if they go to just the Generations United website, which is gu.org. One of the first clicks they can then do is to go to the GU conference website and they'll get all the information there. Fantastic. I feel like people need to, we've been talking about this, deconstruct ageism, number one, but look at older adults as social capital. And that's been another theme of the Age Boom Academy that I'm part of. We, As you said, we need to value their wisdom, their life experiences. And when a teen can disconnect from their phone, let's say, and go spend the, the day with somebody. My daughter did this when she was 13. She had a volunteer experience. She had to, she decided to volunteer in a retirement home. It was supposed to be a few months. And someone came up to us and said, excuse me, when, when her internship is done or community service project is done, please don't bail on this woman. And by then, I mean, we knew we would never do that. So our friendship lasted over seven years. That's wonderful. Harriet lived to be a hundred. And I share the story about Harriet with everyone because I think it's, it's so important, especially for the younger generation to value people that they don't even know, 
you know? I agree. And I think it's something that we start young. I always remember I was on a panel once with a 16 year old and he started his remarks by saying, I've been volunteering since I was six months old and now I drive myself. Oh. His mother, his mother used to take him to be held by older adults in a oh. facility. And I so he just, <laughs> that's wonderful. So he grew up, yes. that was normal to be around older adults. So as he got older and more independent, his mom didn't have to carry him anymore. He would drive himself, mm -hmm. but it's something that, that was just a part of his life and a part of him. Yes. I also remember a young man who there was a uh, big brothers, big sisters program that was where the, the little brother was an elder and the big brother was a teenager. And so this young man became very close. Sounds sort of like your daughter became very close to the, uh, the gentleman that he was visiting. Mm -hmm. And when he got his driver's license, the first thing he did was drive over to set, tell him hello. Oh. I mean, how many 16 year old <laughs> boys are going to drive over to tell somebody who's 85 that <laughs> Look at me, I got my license. It's None. wonderful. And the other thing is we need to engage more in conversation. I, I would love to launch a project where um, I have students connect with their grandparents. So interview them, find out more about them. And if they don't have grandparents, find someone else to interview an older mm -hmm. adult. They have such amazing stories and experiences to share that could be very enlightening. They really do. I, I agree with you in that kind of sharing. Um, There's some great examples where younger people help to, uh, to, to make sure that we don't lose those stories. One of my favorite memories of, of, a, of a program like that was in the UK where there was a shipyard that had been closed down and the students at the high school students were asked to go and interview the old shipyard workers. And so they would set up their cameras and they would interview and say, what was it like when the shipyard was active and you were, uh, you know, you worked the docks and all that. And one gentleman at the end of the interview said, I never thought my life mattered. Oh. And so that capturing, that acknowledgement of their experience and stories is very powerful. Yeah. But I also agree with what you were saying earlier about human capital, because one thing that people don't think about, and I, I was fortunate enough to um, have a conversation with the Federal Reserve Board once about intergenerational work. And so I wanted to put the, 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 the rationale in terms that would make sense with, uh, you know, a, a body that, that deals with, with financial issues. And so we did some calculations about older adults, the value of their time, how much time people document that older adults watch television, how did I, so if, if we were to take just a few hours a, a, a week from 10% of the older adult population, and they were to give that to volunteer that, in a year, it would be worth over a billion dollars in new volunteer hours. So it's like this human capital asset if we need to think about it in those terms. I just think it's the right thing to do. But if we need to monetize it, we can do that. I do too. Because when you stop connecting with older adults, they get very isolated and there's depression and people don't take the time to recognize this. Um, there's dementia. My, my grandmother suffered from dementia, but I also know she had very little interaction with people. And I believe that contributed to it. She had trouble hearing, which I now know is a factor. Mm -hmm. So the more you can connect, it, as you know, I don't have to tell you this, but really the listeners, the more you can connect with people in conversation and really engage with them and pick up the phone and have those phone calls with people you haven't connected to, connected with in a long time is really impactful right now. I agree. It's really an important time for people to reach out. And I also agree with you that when we isolate older adults and don't have that stimulation, that dementia um, and physical woes really start to exacerbate. Um, one of my favorite um, quotes was from a child care provider in an intergenerational center in, um, in Westchester County, New York. And she had been you know, working at this child care center, directing this child care center that's in, that's co-located with an adult daycare center for over 20 years. And she said, they rise to meet the expectations of the other. 
They rise to meet the expectations of the other, meaning you might have a child that's acting out. You might have an older adult who's totally dis, 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 disconnected, disassociated. Yes. You put them together, the child calms down, the older adult perks up. Yes. They rise to meet the expectation of the other. They, and, and it's, it's, it's not something you teach. It's, not some, it's, it's, it's what happens when we connect generations um, and don't just segregate generations so they're only with people who are like them. Yeah, I agree. I'm going to share something with you. When my grandmother was um, 89, she passed away June um, of her almost, yeah, she had just turned 89. I hadn't spoken to her in a little while. My had had a baby and I was so busy and I called her up and the women who were taking care of her at the retirement home said, oh, I'm sorry, she, she's really not speaking a lot lately. She was living in Florida and I'm here in California. And I said, could you just hold the phone to her ear because her birthday fell on Mother's Day. And I used to send her flowers and Snickers because that was her favorite candy bar. So they said, well, well, she's not really speaking. I said, could you just please hold the phone to her ear? So they held it up and I said, hi grandma, it's Janine. And all of a sudden she said, hi, sweetie pie. <laughs> <laughs> and they couldn't believe it. It's because she didn't have that engagement with anyone. Right. But she also loved you. Oh, yeah. And to hear your voice and to know she was talking with you, it just snapped with something that was, yep. you know, there was still a lot there. It's just nobody else you know, had that ability to pull that out. I'm not sure other people might have, but, but that connection that you had with her is what oh, made that so very special. It was very wonderful. special. Yeah. Anything else you'd like to share with us about your organization? Just so that, you know, Generations United, our, our work is really to encourage people to reach out and connect with other generations. So if you don't have somebody who's older in your life, find somebody. And if you don't have somebody who's younger, find somebody. We really are stronger together. And it doesn't have to be a big formal program. It can start small and it can be one-on-one, -on -one, but everybody has the opportunity and the responsibility to connect with another generation. Fantastic. I've been speaking with Donna Butts, Executive Director of Generations United. I put all the information on my show blog, which is getthefunkoutshow.kuci.org. And their website is gu.org. And Donna, let me just explain the name of my show, Get the Funk Out. It's an inspiring show for people that are going through a tough time. That's where the name came from. Great. Well, I think you're doing a super job. I really appreciate the invitation to spend some time with you today. 